My next guest for the last portion of our show tonight is going to be Madeline Murray O'Hare. Um, if you know about Mrs. O'Hare, she is a, a famous, and some people say infamous woman. Uh, it's always easy to appear on a television show and express popular views that the audience seems to go along with, uh, but very often when somebody holds uh, certain beliefs or views that the majority of the population do not think popular, it's kind of easy to, uh, to turn. So um, she is here really to do two things, talk about her position, also to answer a, a certain charge that uh, Reverend Billy Graham made on the show several weeks ago. Uh, Mrs. O'Hare is the self-admitted atheist who uh, brought about the U.S. Supreme Court ban on prayers in public schools in 1963. And uh, would you welcome her, please, Madeline Murray O'Hare. It is nice to see you again. Well, you're not too much in a vault tonight, though, Johnny, because last time you played when the Saints came marching in. I think we did when you were on the show. Yes. The band played when the Saints come marching in. <laughs> <laughs> band has a great, great sense of humor there. Well, uh, <laughs> something went wrong tonight. Now, before we... Uh, We'll start any place, but I thought maybe I would read a transcript, if it's all right with you. I brought it to read you. brought you. it also? <laughs> all right. No, no, come on now. Let's, uh, let's have some manners here, because as I said, it is It'll easy It'll get funnier sometime. later. All righty. Uh, the actual transcript that I wanted to reply to was this. Carson said uh, to Billy Graham, have you ever had any correspondence at all with Madeline Murray on any kind of talk show or such? And Graham said, no, I never have. And Carson said, because she is, uh, as you know, a very crusty individual. A crusty <laughs> meaning very outspoken. And I, at which point he was interrupted by Graham, who said, she wrote me a letter once, and it was, she used so many four-letter words, and a couple of them I have never heard, and I thought I had heard most of them. And Carson said, really? I didn't realize that, which is a, a regular line for you. Yes, well, I didn't know how, <laughs> how, how exactly to really reply like that. Well, the only thing, I want to brush over this uh, very lightly. Uh, I am here tonight in the defense of the four-letter word. And uh, I would not use four-letter words in a letter to Billy Graham, simply because uh, my political acumen and uh, my business acumen would preclude me from doing any such thing. There is no such letter. And the only thing that I have uh, to say to Billy Graham tonight is something from the Bible, naturally. Deuteronomy 5.16. Dear Billy Graham, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, and that's all. All right, you've uh, made your case, and uh, very simple. I have a reputation, uh, I have a reputation for the use of the four-letter word, and I want to talk about the use of the four-letter word tonight, primarily because my husband is watching this show, and uh, I want to tell him why I have been doing this also. I use four-letter words exquisitely, delightfully, deliberately, and abundantly whenever they need to be used. And I very rarely scatter these pearls before swine. I, uh, <laughs> that was low, wasn't it? Yes, that's a sneaky one. <laughs> that was a sneaky one. I use these uh, speeches at colleges and universities, and I'm generally paid, oh, up to $3,000 to go into the colleges and swear. <laughs> this is because uh, we take seriously separation of church and state, and the whole issue of obscenity has to do with separation of church and state. I simply am not going to let the church tell me, not alone, what to wear. I can't be nude. I'm not going to permit the church to tell me what I'm going to eat, fish on a certain day, for instance, for a long while. I'm not going to permit the church to tell me how many children I'm going to have uh, because of uh, the um, information which is available on birth control. And I'm not going to let the church take certain words which are vital and charge them, put a charge on them, that those words really do not have. Now, if you look at uh, four-letter words, and I've looked at them, and this is a part of my speech uh, that I give to the colleges and universities, there are only 13 four-letter words, that's all. That's what you would call, or many people would call, uh, what, obscene words or... Uh, well, profane words are obscene words. words, but you see the word profane itself. Fane means a church. And profane means that these words are only for the church's use in reality. And if one ever reads an excommunication, uh, one finds out that, of course, the church uses four-letter words in excommunications. They say, may you be damned in sitting, may you be damned in talking, may you be da damned in uh, fornicating, may you be damned in um, uh, urinating, may you be damned in uh, flatulating. 
and cetera, and they are quite specific in their use of the four-letter words. So I think that the word profane means that these words really should be kept for the use of the church. And I don't see this. I will not permit the church or any other entity to tell me that they're going to put a charge upon that word, and from now on, no one can use that word. That's just the same as I, as a cardinal in the American Atheist Church, would say to you, Billy, uh, I mean, Johnny Carson, what's your primary advertiser? And if you would say General Motors, I'd say, well, from now on, that's going to be a profane word and you can't use it. What this does is to take that word out of circulation and it also takes that feeling tone. Now, these uh, 13 profane words or 13 four-letter words have to do first <coughs> with vital functions of the body. Mm -hmm. The first, there are five of them which describe parts of the body. These parts are living parts of the body without which we would expire tomorrow. And then functions of those parts of the body, and without these functions of the parts of the body, we also, we would be dead immediately. Uh, they're life-giving, they're li life-fulfilling, and this only indicates that the church is primarily either anti-human or anti-life in their concept of outlawing all reference to these activities. Let me give you an example. All right. The most beautiful, the most satisfying, the most exhilarating thing that anybody really can do and do day in and day out and really feel good because of it is to have a bowel movement. Now, <laughs> why knock it? Why knock it? Uh, there's no sense in saying, well, we can only refer to this as a BM uh, or we go into a hospital, you know, and I, I've had uh, some curious experiences in hospitals. I once had a doctor say, to me when I wanted a pap test. Do you want me to examine you down there? And I said, no, you don't need to get on the floor to do it. You can do it from <laughs> standing up. But Using some euphemistic language. There to, are very, uh, very peculiar uses of these words. There are very, very peculiar uses of these terms and I won't have it. In substance, what I'm saying to the college audience is everywhere, mm. is do not say, oh, look at that fornicating fuzz. Using something else, of mm. course. You don't say that simply because the reason that fuzz is uptight and the reason he's having difficulty is because he's not fornicating. So you don't refer in those terms to that kind of a situation. I think that the four letter word indicating indi indicative of fornication should be something like this. Johnny, you're recently married. Mm -hmm. You went to your wife and you grabbed her in your arms and you, you were, you know, and you said to her, may I have carnal knowledge of you? I don't remember using those exact <laughs> terms. I think, I think many people in the audience are agreeing with what you're saying. Is it also possible that the euphemistic expressions, the four-letter words, make a lot of people feel uncomfortable because of the sound of the words? No, uh, I, tried to, uh, I tried to explore that to see whether or not there was actually the sound. And I think most of those words, many is... of them, the word you're referring to is used as a noun, an adjective, a verb. Uh, it really it has no... It shouldn't be, though. It is simply a verb. And uh, the point to, to use this, I think that if all of the women in the audience tonight who really want to turn their husband on would just snuggle up tonight to him and say, let's four letter word, you would get a much better reaction, really, than uh, saying let's fornicate or just anything like that. I don't think there's Easy. a man in the audience who would disagree with you. <laughs> no, that's true. That is true and it is honest. These are the intimate experiences that I think that are necessary for people to do. I never tell my granddaughter to go into the bathroom and urinate. That's not what she's doing in there. If we're going to take this ridiculous thing of constantly substituting a, a Latin word for a four-letter word, then I'm going to see, say it to you at the end of this performance, uh, osculate me with your labia. You know, right here. Mm -hmm. You'd think, my, she's a dirty old woman. And all right. I'm doing is asking for a kiss. Or you might be sitting there and I say, oops, you know what Johnny just did? Ah, oh, he expulsed a flatus. Many people don't even know that word, you know, talking about sounds. I know what you're, I, 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 I'm, I'm familiar. I, I, <laughs> As a matter of fact, Mark Twain m wrote the most delightful book I have ever read in my life, uh, solely, completely, and only on the subject of a, of a queen who was flatulating. Yes, and, I think uh, Mark Twain also once said to his wife, if I recall, when she was using, he was a notorious swearer himself, Sam Clemens. Well, and his wife was using some of these like terms, and he said to his wife once, he says, Mary, if that was her name, you know the <laughs> words, but you don't have the rhythm. <laughs> uh, and there's a lot to be said for that. 
Well, I do, as I say, I do this constantly because we're talking now about five words, uh, the apertures of the body, five words which pertain to their use, and then three words in derogation of women. And uh, the church, of course, has constantly been the chief suppressant of women. And the three words that are constantly used over and over and over again to abuse women have to do uh, first one of them uh, equating her to a female dog, right. and uh, the second one uh, equating a child of hers to an illegitimate status, and uh, the third uh, to equate her to a woman of the night. And I think that this kind of a referent constantly from the church in respect to women only indicates just how much the church has degraded uh, women and the position uh, which women are struggling for in relationship to women's lib uh, has to do with the kind of uh, brushing aside of this performance of religion over 1,600 years of Christianity. And I think it's just time that we stopped permitting the church to charge these words. I think that it's time that we began to use, we began now, to use those words in exactly the way that they were intended to use. There's nothing wrong with them. If I'm going I have to noticed, for, excuse me for interrupting, I have noticed at, uh, uh, at certain gatherings uh, where you know friends well, that they use them quite frequently and nobody is, seems uh, uptight about it at all. Uh, well, they use them in Japan, And they use them they all use the them time. All they in, say in them Europe. constantly, mm -hmm. men and women. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's impolite oh, or no. that's uh, bad manners. Uh, it's gross. Uh, We're no, gonna talk, no longer going to say that we have a nose because that's an Anglo-Saxon four-letter word. We're going to say we have a proboscis. I mean, really, how ridiculous can anyone get? Or we're going to refer constantly. Is the analogy quite the same about proboscis and nose as it is to a, a, a part of the body that's referred to? Is it exactly the, a fair analogy? I think so. I think so. Because I can sit here and talk about penises all night long. Nobody cares. I can sit here and talk and say, oh, well, you know, everybody out there has a scrotum. Uh, if they've got uh, proper, uh, every man out there has a scrotum. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. As long as you don't talk about mine, Madeline. All right. Let me, uh, let me interrupt for a moment. We have to we'll do this commercial, and we will be right back. We're talking with uh, Madeline Murray O'Hare. I think we talked to uh, Mrs. O'Hare once when you were on the show some years ago. Uh, about atheism, and you said that if they made a poll or something to this effect of people and they, they privately express their beliefs, you might find that there are a lot more atheists uh, in the world because it's not a popular belief to express publicly. It could, could cause loss of jobs uh, many it times. Does, it uh, does. If you don't put down a religious affiliation, uh, people think you're a heathen. Uh, there seems to be, in our culture anyway, there must be almost a, a demand before you become a complete person, that you express a belief in a creator or a supreme being, quote, or life after death. Isn't that almost one of the tenets of... Uh... This is right. The other thing is the efficacy of prayer. One must say something in relationship to that in right. order to uh, be accepted into the community. And I think that I would like to say something about the atheist world tonight, uh, because we're much al uh, maligned. Uh, if a person like Billy Graham can get on a national network show and make a crack about the, the leader of the atheist community in America. This means that we are much maligned and we are much abused. And we aren't like that at all. I don't know any atheists, really, uh, who don't have a, a plethora of degrees in almost any kind of uh, science. Uh, there are more atheists in the college community, more atheists with PhDs than there certainly are atheists uh, cotton picking. Well, freedom. Uh, this, uh, this, me, I'm sorry. this means nothing. I have nothing against the cotton pickers. Uh, they have a, a great number of atheists with them in their ranks too. But what I'm saying, this is an exercise of reason, and those persons who are constantly uh, using their minds in their daily activities are those persons who finally come <coughs> to the position of atheism. And uh, we're starting now to do several things. I just got a letter from the president of the University of Texas, for instance, who said that it would be all right uh, for me to go ahead and continue uh, my <clears throat> uh, application with the uh, religious uh, chairs there in order for me to have a chair teaching Bible at the University of Texas. And I'm going to pursue that. The atheist community, we have our own magazine called the American Atheist Magazine. We have a newsletter that we get out uh, monthly. We have a number of atheist organizations with magazines. We have our own uh, radio station, with, uh, radio um, program, which ca is called the American Atheist Radio Program. And currently, it is on uh, something like 21 
uh, radio stations as a public service feature throughout the United States. Uh, we also have uh, something like 24 radio stations which are giving us spot announcements for atheism. Something like take an atheist to lunch tomorrow. Well, or, freedom of religion yeah. does mean, does it not, freedom to uh, follow any beliefs that you may wish uh, this personally. Is true. Which also means the freedom not to believe or freedom to believe in whatever you wish or not to believe also. I think That's people right. forget that sometimes. We act as a clearinghouse also uh, for all of the complaints of persons who are involved in church-state separation. There is still constantly Bible reading and prayer recitation in the public schools. There's the passing of Gideon Bibles out in the public schools. <clears throat> there is the uh, Why are people need so emotional? Um, why do they put the battleground in the public schools and become so emotionally involved when people say, you mean they're not going to permit our children uh, to start their daily uh, <coughs> schedule with a non-denominational prayer? Their argument, of course, is how can it affect anybody? It can't hurt. Um, well, there why? is no such a thing uh, as a non-denominational prayer because vis-a-vis -vis <coughs> the world, uh, Christianity, for instance, is a sect. And uh, if we would have suddenly the Muslims or the Hindus take over and every person be required to say a prayer to Allah, there would be as much alarm and as much up in arms as there is now from the fact that we would like to have the public schools and the secular community to be neutral. We believe that religion is a private affair. Everybody has a right to have their religion. They have a right to have their churches. They have a right to have their schools. They have a right to have their institutions. But we feel one thing, they should pay for all of them. They shouldn't ask for special tax favors and they shouldn't ask for taxpayers' monies. They can own their banks and their oil companies and they can own their stocks and bonds, of which they really own hundreds of millions of dollars. That's their business, but they should pay tax on the income from all of that. They shouldn't take advantage of our generosity in dealing with religion and uh, say, all right, don't you we'll find see many, that you get skinned. Excuse me, don't you find that many clergy nowadays of all denominations agree with you on that point, that their this outside interest, thing. outside of... Uh, the grounds that the church or temples stand on, uh, many of them in the recent years have said, yes, we should pay uh, a fair share of taxes when we are involved in, in a business that has no direct Well, the Presbyterian uh, Church, for, as an example, have, has said over and over to me from their official hierarchy, yes, Madeline, we should pay tax. Meantime, they keep all of their businesses tax-free. So the talk is cheap, and I would remind them all, all of the clergy, who say with me, yes, we agree with you in uh, respect to separation of church and state, we should be taxed. I would say, please read your Bible also and see what Paul had to say, because he said, in respect to Christianity, isn't, uh, it is not by your words, but by your deeds that we shall know you. And when they step up to the taxpayer and say, here's the money, I'll believe them. But as long as they do not, and they're only mouthing the thing that they should pay taxes, then I have absolutely no confidence in them, and I feel that they're hypocritical by and large. You've drawn these lines before, and the question is almost academic now, but uh, when you define atheists, and some people say they're agnostics, uh, sometimes they don't understand exactly the way an atheist operates. And if I, re if I remember what you said, you structure your life without any worry that there is any afterlife or a creator or whatsoever. You, this is right. The uh, word atheism means simply as the word independence. The word independence is a negative word, and this doesn't mean that philosophy flowing from that word is negative. The word independence meanly, means simply free from dependency. And the word atheist, which is a negative word, means simply free from theism. And we say to the theists in the community, all right, if you want to believe in God, that's your business. If you want to pray, that's your business. You take your marbles and go over there in the corner of your private life and you play your game. But that's not um, relevant to the living community now. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with the government. It has nothing to do with politics. It actually hasn't got anything to do with business. It has nothing to do with science. It has nothing to do with education. So therefore, do your thing but leave this outer community free. We want to be free from religion. And as a matter of fact, that's the title of a, of a new book that I'll have out by April, Freedom From Religion. And this gets back again to the obscenity thing. I want freedom from religion. If I want to go into the bathroom and urinate, I want to go in there and do what I want to do and not have to call this by another name. And uh, I'm, I'm very determined that we shall have that kind of freedom from religion that we need. Excuse me for interrupting again, but we must, and we will uh, have a message, and we shall return. We have three minutes left, Mrs. O'Hare. I was listening to the, the buzz in the audience uh, when you talk about atheism, and I suppose because people have been brought up as youngsters with religion, it's become such a part of their life, become very emotional, and a lot of people are probably asking how you can 
justify your life here without some faith in, in something other greater than this. I'm sure you get this all the time. And uh, does it worry you that uh, when you die that there is not going to be nirvana or whatever you care to call it? Uh, no, not at all. We feel that we're inner-directed, not outer-directed. We feel that we're independent, not dependent. Uh, we feel that we can make our own judgments and not ask someone else or some outer source to make our judgments for us. We feel that we should live a rich, full, beautiful, kind, love-filled life to the best of our ability and uh, in the best direction in which we can, looking constantly for the total human community. And this is sufficient just to be alive right. is quite wonderful. Haven't you find that many times that some groups who claim to be uh, very religious have been the most violent uh, to react to your position? Uh, because you had a great amount of abuse in the state of Maryland, as your children did in school. Yes, we Has did. it all been worth it? I guess is what I'm trying to say, because you've been called at times one of the most hated women in America, and I wonder if, you, if, if the battle has, has been worth it personally. Well, I think, yes, the battle has been worth it personally. And uh, one of the things that I want to say here tonight, if I may, too, I really appreciate the fact that you uh, brought me on here without a contentious clergyman here so that I could say what I wanted to say. And I uh, infrequently have this on television programs because quite frequently there's a protagonist immediately there in the black collar. Anybody who really wants to know what an atheist is or what atheism is all about, we put out a magazine, we put out a newsletter. If you'll just write me a letter and ask me for it, we'll be glad to send you a sample copy. And the only thing that you have to do in order to get any information from us uh, is to write to Madeline Murray O'Hara and be sure to put the magic word atheist on it and address it to Austin, Texas. You see, I could even hear a gasp in the audience when you said that. You still touch. That's right, those... I still touch a chord. But we're well known in the Austin community and the mail comes in like that and uh, we're perfectly willing to try to reach people so that when you hear someone come on to television and malign us in any way or uh, make a remark like um, uh, Billy Graham did, you will know really what we're like if you get it from the horse's uh, mouth. We must take a break. We shall return. Mm -hmm. 